All right, how are we going there, Gabby? All good. So, um, g'day everyone, thanks for joining us. Um, my name's Clint Proctor. Uh, I work with the Alcohol and Drug Foundation. We're um, grateful to bring Steve Hooker here today to have a chat to our sporting clubs um, who are involved in the Good Sports Program. There's a few people in the waiting room sort of coming in at the moment, so um, bear with us from there and just be mindful, please, to um, make sure that uh, you guys are muted throughout the chat. Um, I just want to do an acknowledgement uh, of country and, um, and thank everyone for coming, but also acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, um, the Wurundjeri people, the Kulin Nation, um, pay my respects to the past elders and present, and any emerging young people. Um, I guess the purpose for this today is to connect with all of our sporting clubs across Australia, but in particular the Victorians and um, through the challenges of the lockdown again. And um, to catch up with Steve and to basically unpack his story and talk about his challenges, setbacks and resilience and, um, and, and hear his story about how he got through it and hopefully give us some light at the end of the tunnel too. Because, um, you know, it has been a difficult, um, I guess, moment for Victorians at this point in stage. So, Steve, um, I will say thanks very much for joining us and um, how is lockdown treating you? G'day, Clint. Thanks for having me. Um, oh, look, I think like everyone, um, it's now long and frustrating and, and, and it's challenging, particularly this next couple of weeks. Um, but, but up until now, I mean, I've been lucky in a way. Um, we've got a, a 10 month old, so I've been working from home and I've been able to see my third child um, in his first year quite a bit. So that's going to be our last baby and I never would have got to have this, this time with him. So that's been really cool. He's currently in the taking first steps process so I get to see all of that which is really really exciting um, in terms of like how we're managing within our family and also within the people I work with we've sort of set this last three weeks of stage four as a bit of a 21 day challenge where we're all going to try and um, tick some things off and turn it into an opportunity um, over this 21 days rather than have it as a, a countdown um, because you know there's still going to be a fair bit of road ahead of us after this so we're turning this into a really positive 21 days. And, you know, for me, it's about um, trying to get out and, and have some walks um, with people that live within a five kilometer radius that I do a bit of work with. So it's just trying to have a bit more of that networking and personal contact with people I do business with. That's what I've challenged myself with over this uh, 21 days or the final 21 days, hopefully at stage four. True professional um, mindset, mate. Um, obviously you built that up over your time through you know, competing. Um, in regards to work life after sport, what are you doing at the moment with yourself? Uh, yeah, so uh, even when I was doing, doing sport, particularly in the early years, I, I worked in property. So I did the RMIT property degree and I worked for Stockland from sort of 2001 through to 2007. So Stockland's a big national property developer. Uh, I was part of their graduate program and then kept on working with them. Uh, so I've, got, I've gone back to property. I'm currently CEO of Resimax Group. Um, so Resimax Group is a, is a developer and builder in, uh, in Melbourne. So love working there, love the team that I work with. And, um, you know, it took a while to get there after retiring from sport, but I found, you know, a, a, a space and a group of people that I, I really enjoy working with. I, I jump out of bed with the same vigour as I did when I was an athlete. Fantastic. No, it's cool to hear, mate. So... Look, I'll change your tune a little bit and I'll, I will mention, um, I guess, your career and what you've achieved because I know you won't want to sort of speak about it um, in total. But um, for everyone here listening, obviously, you know, we know your success you've had, but um, I'll give a brief, you know, you won gold in Beijing um, with the vault of, you know, 5.96 metres, setting a new Olympic record, um, you know, making you the first Australian male on track gold, gold medalist in 40 years. Must have been pretty cool. Then... In 2009, World Athletics Championships in Berlin, you win gold despite an injury, which I'm really keen to um, hear about um, in this conversation. Um, through that, Indoor World Champs, Commonwealth Games, um, London Olympics, and then recently um, awarded the Medal of uh, Order in Australia and inducted into Sport Australia Hall of Fame as an athlete member. Before we jump into, I guess, the childhood and things like that, that must be pretty cool to sit back and reflect and think that you've had a good time of it. Yeah, now it's amazing. I mean, when I was in the, in the midst of it, for me, I had, I had a really good sort of five-year window, I suppose, 2006 till 2010. Uh, it all kind of happened within that, that chunk of time. And 
when I was in that, I was very focused, you know, like I, the, the one where it really stuck with me was sort of the start of 2010. I won a world indoor championship and that completed the set for me. That, that meant that I'd won every medal. I was, I was the holder of every championship. And it was kind of weird. I, I kind of did that and I was like, I'm a bit tired, but I was thinking, okay, well, what's next for training and what's coming up for the season and what am I going to achieve? You get very much into that athlete mindset of what's next. So it's nice now to be able to, to be away from that and to have a lot of distance. You know, it's been 10 years since that for me now. And just to look back on it with like a lot of pride and, and gratitude for what I was able to um, be a part of, to have the right team around me, um, to have found the event that suited me, all of that sort of stuff. So I look back with, um, I'm really grateful for it and really <clears throat> pretty proud of what I was able to achieve. You mentioned the event that suited you. So pole vaulting wouldn't be every um, young person's dream to grow up and want to be a pole vault, I can't imagine, unless, of course, you come on the scene and we want to be like you. So let's hear, how was the childhood growing up? How did you get into pole vaulting? Um, I had a good childhood. Uh, I grew up in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne. Um, both of my parents were athletes, so I sort of was lucky, got good genes. I'm very lucky from that, on that front. Uh, and I was sort of, as a kid, I would always play footy in the winter and do athletics in the summer whenever I could. Um, uh, did athletics at Box Hill Athletics Club. Um, still got a, a, a massive soft spot for that club. It was a great group of people. A long history of Olympians, but more importantly, lots of pole holders came out of that place. I was a great coach there, Mark Stewart. He, he ran a really good club, super passionate about it. And the most important thing for a pole vault club is just having poles. They're really expensive. So everyone shares the poles. You've got a big shed of pole vault poles and you join that club. And that's kind of how I got into all of that. Um, and yeah, it was an ama amazing to be able to jump into an elite group of, in with a, an elite group of athletes that were all getting ready for the Sydney Olympics when I was 15 years old. And I went from doing athletics twice a week to training six days a week and you couldn't hold me back from it. Yeah, that's cool. Actually, one thing I just want to ask about that. So, you know, we've got basically um, Victoria being a lockdown and a pandemic and things like that and um, equipment sharing. Is that, is that something that you think may be a concern for clubs um, going forward? You mentioned the poles and they're expensive, right? And I can imagine that, you know, all sort, you'd be using lots of different equipment. How do you think clubs will sort of go with that challenge? Yeah, it's pretty hard. Some sports are harder than others. Pole vault's pretty tough. So because you're landing on the mat and a bunch of, I don't know, bodily fluids come out of you when you land on the mat, they're only allowed to have one person train on a mat at, the t at a time. You'd normally have six or seven people jumping in a group. So they can only have one at a time. You've got to wipe down the equipment between people. So it's really tough. It's going to be a hard um, 12 to 24 months as we work through all of this. Mm. Um, but people adapt and they adjust and, and they find their way through it. So people, people will find other things to do. Like just don't, you just can't think that I can do things the way that I did them previously, find other um, ways to practice skills, find other ways to get your speed and your strength and all of those things together. And often doing things differently will result in a better result. Um, yeah. It's um, adversity leads to opportunity. And we're seeing that now on the global scene in athletics, you're seeing people putting out performance performances that they've never done before in their life at some of the highest standards we've ever seen and that's because people have done things differently the competition cycle has been broken and they're finding new ways to improve so um, there is opportunity in all of it as well yeah that's really exciting to hear um in regards to i guess athlete development as i sort of want to push this story into you know the olympic games in 2009 you're competing at a local level um and then you sort of obviously uh, identified to, to, you know, go on to the next level. How, how did you go, how did you cope essentially with going from local to state and then national? Um, it's a good question. So for, for me, the transition from junior to senior was a tough one. That was the hardest year for me. So I, I came fourth at the World Junior Championships in 2000. Um, and then I had a really tough sort of three years after that, 2000 to 2003 was quite challenging for a number of reasons. It's a, it's a big step to go from junior athletics to senior. You go from competing against kids to grown-ups. Uh, but also for me mentally, I, I struggled with the event, um, with the, the sort of mental side of it. So um, working, working through that was a challenge. But then once I, once I got going, um, you know, I, I started to turn things around in 2003. And then um, 2004, I just had a really good year. Everything sort of started to click. I grew into my body. Um, I got over a lot of the mental issues that I've been having, having through a lot of hard work. 
And then all of a sudden I found myself in the frame where I was one of four guys that looked like it, there were a chance to qualify for Athens. And um, that got me really excited and inspired and uh, managed to do that, managed to qualify for that team against, you know, ahead of a couple of really, really good pole holders. And that set me up for success. Was there anything particular with regards to the mental side? I'm really keen to hear about this because it's such a, I guess, uh, challenge at the moment mentally for everyone with the pandemic and things. But given that you were struggling mentally, was there strategies you used? Yeah, I mean, so for me, it was, I, I, I suppose it was a fear factor type thing. So there, there's a moment in every jump where you've got to commit to taking off. So it would be like standing on top of a 10 metre diving board. And there's a moment where you've got to say to your body, jump and do a somersault and dive into the pool, right? And if, imagine at that moment, if you, you, you want to jump and then something in your brain says no, you're just going to find yourself standing there. So the equivalent in pole vault is you run in and there's a moment where you've got to commit, you've got to jump off the ground and hold onto the pole. And at that moment, I would just let go of the pole and I'd run through to the mat. And um, that's, that's a no jump. So that's what I'd had for sort of two years on and off. I was dealing with that issue. And how I dealt with it was um, nothing too special. <laughs> and that's, look, there's no magic silver bullet for these. It's get back to basics. So get back to like the technical fundamentals of the event and things that you know you can do. So have some success. So do an easy drill that you know you can do, practice that drill, and then make that drill harder by moving your run up back or um, taking a bigger pole or something like that. Um, and it's just repetition of that and exposure because it's a fear thing, basically. It's mm -hmm. exposure to that. And so getting over that anxiety and fear that you feel, feel at that moment so that the successful outcome becomes the thing that you experience more and more regularly. And that's how you turn that negative cycle around into a positive cycle. And once you, once you move from, from something that's spiraling negative into something that's like um, um, spiraling in a positive way, then um, you find it can turn around quite quickly. And the good feelings start coming back and the positive approach to every training session or competition returns and you, you find your, your old self again. Yeah, that's really cool. And in regards to the last thing around, I guess, this sort of development as you come through, I'm interested to know about the coaching side of things and teammates. How, how does that look with a pole vaulter? Uh, most pole vaulters are training in a group. And okay. I mean, the group that I trained with in Melbourne, they were all my best friends. We would hang out at training. We would hang out away from training. We would travel together for competitions. We'd travel for get, together for end of season trips. To, like, we, were, we were just best mates. So yeah. um, that was a huge part of it for me uh, was the group of people that I was there with and the club that I was a part of. Um, and, and it's also one of the things that like that, that was not, not my entire social network, but a big part of my social network. And that's a social network where training and pushing yourself and excelling is sort of a part of that. Like I didn't feel like I was missing out on another lifestyle that yeah. you know, a lot of people say they feel like oh, I miss out on the nights out and all that sort of yeah. stuff. I didn't feel like I was missing that because I was surrounded by so many people that were yeah. thinking about things the same way that I was. Yeah, that's cool. Um, we had a question from one of our audiences um, before this about to, about surrounding yourself with the right people and the, the challenges for young people at the moment in particular, you know, with other opportunities to play different sports and things like that so how did you like were you just lucky that you fell into that sort of frame or did you sort of select it or was it true um, was it true simply your environment that you were brought up in i mean i'm you you've spent a little bit of time around me clint you know that i'm a fairly driven person so very competitive <laughs> for me for me um <laughs> It, it suited me to have those people around, but I would also hang out with my mates from school who had a completely different lifestyle. My, like my mates from school would, would party and that would be what their weekend was about and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And I'd go and hang out with them and happily not partake in whatever they were doing, you know? So I would be there and they would be my friends, but I had this vision of what I wanted to do with my life and what I wanted yeah. to be and where I wanted to go. So I could be there with them and I would be with my friends, but I didn't have to do what they were doing. Yeah, makes. cool. Uh, so just you, being able to like really separate those two things and understand that they can live in parallel. Yeah, cool. That's that's. I think that's really great to hear. So, you know, basically, you could they could respect that and separate it too. Yep. Yeah, fantastic. Well, I guess as you move through, mate, we 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 get to the Olympic Games. Um, what's the lead up like? How like how do you essentially qualify if if I'm you know. I don't know much about the Olympics and things like that, which you probably realise I don't, um, apart from what I've researched on, on Steve here. Um, but basically, how does it look? What's the journey like? 
Um, oh, well, I, I got to number one in the world by 2006. So I finished 2006 ranked number one pole holder in the world. Okay. That put 2008 in the focus for me. Like I, at that point in time, I was like, okay, well, I'm going there for one thing and one thing only, and that's to win. Yeah. Um, 2007 World Championships, I came ninth, had a shocking result. And off the back of that, 12 months out of the, from the games, me and my coach and the rest of our team, we just put in place a really solid plan about what we wanted to do, how we wanted to approach the season, how we wanted to approach our training and what that meant for then a, a strategy we would take into every competition of the 2008 year. Um, I qualified well in advance of it. So I was a pre-selection probably nine months ahead of the game. So I didn't have to worry about a qualification process because my results sort of pre-qualified me for the games. Okay. So that, yeah. wasn't a, that wasn't a problem for me in 2008. So I was really just focused on, focused on my leading competitions and getting myself in the best physical shape for the actual games itself. Um, my whole strategy was around, because um, I, I, I made some mistakes in the 2007 World Championships in, in, the, in the vault. If you miss a couple of attempts, you can always pass your third attempt to the next height. And sometimes you can leapfrog some competitors by doing that. It's, it's like a bit of an aggressive strategy. And I mm -hmm. made some mistakes using that kind of a strategy in 2007. So 2008 was all about getting strong enough and fit enough where I could take lots and lots of jumps in a competition at a high level. And I, my goal there was to take all three attempts at every height and win by jumping the next height rather than trying to win by jumping something by passing. And as it turned out, like that strategy turned out to be the right strategy. You may, yeah. may or may not remember the games, but on four yeah. separate occasions, it took to my third attempt to clear um, the bar. And on a couple of those occasions, if I had of had that same jump at a higher height, it would have been a miss. So that's what kept me in there, that strategy. Yeah. Um, we built a whole preparation around being able to do that. And I think I ended up taking 13 attempts in the final and my 13th jumps. That's a lot of jumps. I've been out for about three hours, 13 jumps. And that final jump was the Olympic record of 596. That is so cool. So, you know, the fundamentals of what your strategy was, was critical to achieving the ultimate goal. Yeah. And, given, and I noticed... Well, and staying calm under pressure, right? So even yeah. in, the, in the big moment, like the, I was second in the jumping order. It was me and a Russian, Yevgeny Lukyanenko. And he would go clear and I would be sitting there and I'd have to take my third attempt. And the choice is, do I pass it to the next title or do I take it here? And we, we just, me and my coach had agreed this from the outset. So I always took it at the same height. So it just it alleviates that pressure in a super high pressure situation where that decision's already made. I'm just going to focus on doing the job. Yeah, that's cool. And I was watching some footage looking back and was it, I think it's one of your jumps. It was your third jump where basically you only just made it and it was a really poor jump. Is this right as well? As well? Yeah. So that was five meters, 85. Yeah. So I, um, yeah, we both cleared five meters 80. He then went clear 585 on his third attempt. I took off the ground on my third attempt at 585 and I just missed my plant. So you got to have your hands directly above your head when you plant the pole. Okay. I, mine were just off to the right. And so as soon as I took off, my body starts flying to the right. Um, any other competition in my life, I would have just said, that's my day over. I'll just try and find something soft to land on um, and save myself for next week. But it's the Olympic Games. So I took the jump up somehow scraped over the bar it's the worst 585 jump i've ever done but somehow i clear the bar and i landed you know centimeters from the edge of the mat survived and was able to carry on with the competition so yeah. i don't know uh, what i do know is the games they do something to you like you, you will always find something special and that was sort of i guess one of those things where i just needed to clear that bar and just found a way to do it yeah and i think it's so cool um given my coaching lens too that, that that's a strategy that enabled it to happen because if you had done what you did the year before you know, yeah, you, it was, that jump would have been at five meters ninety. It would have been a miss. So I would have yeah. would have been a silver medal for me. Wow. So take us through the gold then. Um, you know, you you clear five ninety six, become a um, you know Olympian record. Yeah, I mean, so the goal the, the, goal, the, the gold medal jump was five meters ninety. Yeah. So um, next height after that five eighty five bar goes to five ninety. Um, Luke and Enko and I both miss our first two attempts. He's on the runway, misses his third attempt. And that's your moment where you have a realisation like, okay, this is it. Like, this is now in my hands. So that's, that's the moment I'd been preparing myself for. Um, I'd visualised that jump 10,000 times. So, you know, like on my, on my laptop for that whole year, I had a, my screensaver was the Bird's Nest Stadium from Beijing. 
I know what an athletics track looks like. So in my mind, I'd superimpose the athletics track. You know that you're going to be competing on the D. So that's the infield near the 100 metre start. You know you're going to be running, you know, you're normally running away from the 100 metre start. So in, in my mind, I'd recreated that stadium. And in that stadium, in my mind, I'd done that jump thousands and thousands of times. I mean, I only cleared a third of my jumps in the competition up to that point, right? I wasn't actually going that well. Um, but in that moment, once, the, once it was the jump for gold, it, the craziest thing happened. Like it, all, it just all felt like it was total autopilot. Um, there was no stress within me. There was no anxiety or like overexcitement. I just sort yeah. of almost had an out-of-body experience, watched myself go over, pick up the pole that I knew I needed for that jump, prepared my grip, got everything ready, put my foot on the mark. And everything, everything was in flow from that moment. And, you know, that day was a hard day. They weren't all easy jumps, but from that jump, from the first step of the run up, everything was just on and felt right and took care of itself. And it was just about staying out of my own way and letting it happen. And it was the best right. jump. It was the first really good jump I, I honestly did for the whole day. Um, That's cool. But, that is yeah. so cool, man. So like you almost like manifested that then essentially, like you just knew exactly this is yeah. where the moment I'd, I'll, I'll I'd be. been ready for that moment. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and so it was, it was just making sure I got to the moment and then it was able to take care of itself. Wow. Mate, that's so cool. Um, let's, um, let's change gears a bit, head into 2009. And, and, and I watched this um, the other day with regards to, um, how it unfolded with your injuries to to win the championships in 2009. Pretty remarkable. Um, can you take us through, I guess, essentially how that how that happened? How did you get injured in the first place? Yeah. And then maybe, um, you know, like not, not even warming up and doing things like this. It just sounds crazy. Yeah, so um, I was going really, really good in 2009. So I, about two weeks before the, the World Championships, um, I had a training session at my training venue in Leverkusen in Germany. And like, I was going this good that there was probably a hundred people watching my training session. Like all the, it's a big pole vault club, all the German pole vaulters train. And they just all come out and watching this training session. I was jumping a hard bar and I was attempting a six meter hard bar in training, which I actually don't <laughs> know if anyone's cleared one before. And like, normally like you're finding like 20, 30 centimeters in competition from what you're finding in training. So I was going really, really good. And I honestly thought I'm going to the world championships, but I'm going, I'm going to break the world record. Like that is how good I felt like I was going. So that's 14 days out. Yeah. My next training session is 10 days out and I'm doing one of my warm up jumps and I just felt something pop in my adductor. I never really torn a muscle, which I've been very lucky with my body through my career, never torn a muscle. And I just felt this pop. I was like, what's that? And then I just felt like I lost a bit of range. And then pretty quickly it started to hurt and I realized I had a 10 centimeter tear, like a grade three, which is sort of a three week injury. And there's 10 days until the gang. So uh, 10, 10 days to the competition. Um, so I was pretty gutted for sort of 24 hours. The next day I had to catch the bus from when we were staying in Cologne um, to Berlin. Um, went and got scans in Berlin. It revealed the extent of everything. And we we're going to pull out and we just thought, look, let's just let's just use every hour we have in every day to do whatever we can. So we were icing and doing therapy and doing every single thing we could do, taking it, like making sure we were moving so that it didn't seize up. But just with, with my doctor, physio, coach, we just did everything we could over that period of time. Yeah. And then the day before the qualifying round, I decided to just have a practice run on it. And I could run at about 80% the day before, but could run. And so I was like, okay, well, Let's just give a qualifying round a chance. Like I'd never given up on a competition to this point. So I'm not going to give up on a world championship. So we went out there with a strategy where I would just take one jump in the qualifying round and try and qualify for the final. And by one jump, I meant one jump. So normally you would go out there, you've got an hour before the competition starts. You can do all of your warm ups. You check where your run up marks are, what pole you're jumping on, how high you grip, all this sort of stuff. Whilst every other pole vaulter was doing that, I was just sitting down and having a coffee and just watching them all do it. <laughs> and I just waited and waited until the bar got to a height that I thought would get me in the top 12, which qualifies you for the final. That was five yeah. meters and 65 centimeters. Put down my marker. I'd obviously done my warm, you know, my running warm ups and all that sort of stuff, but it's the first time I've picked up a pole and taken a jump for the whole day, put down a marker, took a jump. Um, as soon as I took off the ground, your body goes on a real stretch. Like you stretch all the way from your hand, all the way down to your tips, of your toes. And it really opened up the kind of injury. So as soon as I took off the ground, it really hurt. And I sort of half black out, I guess, go into autopilot and realize that I've jumped the bar, uh, land on the mat. And I think, okay, great. I've made the final here, but 
I don't think I'm going to be able to jump. And so it's then 48 hours pretty much between qualifying round and final. Um, I was very lucky, really. Um, in between the qualifying round and the final, I had access to a really good therapist through my sponsor at the time. And I just had like a one and a half hour session with him and he just got me moving okay. Um, and so I was moving good enough where I thought, I'm just going to go out and try and do the same thing in the final. I'm going to wait until it's a height where I think I can win a medal. I actually thought there was no chance I could win. I thought if I can, if I can jump five meters 80, I think I can win a medal based on how everyone was going that year. And so that we went out with the same strategy, no warm up in the final. Um, waited, just kept waiting and waiting, but it was a really good day and everyone was jumping really, really well. So by the time the bar got to 580, there were still like six guys in the comp and I thought this isn't going to do it. So I just waited some more, passed until the bar went to 5 meters 85. And I thought, this is it. I'll take my first jump. Um, about 30 minutes before that, we'd, we'd gotten permission from the IAAF, the International Athletics Body, um, where I could get a painkilling injection into my leg. Um, and so he'd done that, like mid-competition. And um, yeah, so I took my first jump at 5 meters 85 and it was a cracker. It was an amazing jump, cleared the bar by about this much, but then like just hit the bar with my chest on the way down, bar wobbles, falls off. And I thought based on the qualifying round, that was probably me done for the day. Yeah. I'm going over to talk to my coach and figure out whatever happens next. And at that point in time, a Frenchman, Romain Menil, he, he cleared five meters 85. And I thought, oh, bugger, that's no good. And so contrary to what I did in, um, Beijing, I said, all right, I'm going to have one more jump, but I'll pass to five meters 90. We made a small adjustment in terms of where the uprights were. You can move where you, you, the bar sits. Yeah, we made a okay. small adjustment to the uprights, ran in, took one more jump, and it was exactly the same jump as the previous jump. But because we'd moved the uprights, I didn't hit it on the way down, and it was a clearance. And that was that. As soon as these, there was two French guys still jumping in the comp, as soon as they'd seen me do this off, like no warm-up, entering the comp late, knowing I was injured, they they just lost it and they had, they both missed three attempts at five meters 90 and that was it. Mentally got them. Yeah. Oh, it's not a strategy I'd recommend to anyone, but it happened. Well, to you certainly flipped day. it from what you did um, basically at the Olympic games where it's all about foundation, the scaffolding, and then to get to the ultimate. But I guess you have to adapt like we are at the moment as well. No difference. So absolutely. You've got to make um, the most of what's in front of you. Yeah, absolutely. And and with regards to that then, Steve, like Olympians in this point in time, your role at the moment with regards to them, what are you, what are you up to? Uh, well, so I'm the chair of the Athletes Commission um, for the Australian Olympic Committee. So I don't know one of the key things for the athletes was actually around the postponement of the Games. Um, we sort of went out and just took the took the su survey of the athletes and just saw how they were feeling. And, and the, the one thing that was getting everyone was the unknown. They just needed some certainty yeah. on what was going to happen. There was a lot of anxiety because to that point, there'd been no call made on whether the games would be delayed. So we pushed pretty hard, you know, internally within the AOC and the AOC in turn really pushed for an outcome from the IOC um, for a confirmation of a revised date. And yep. um, we got really good feedback from that. Even though it wasn't a great result, everyone wanted to compete at the Olympic Games this year. At least knowing when it was going to be and being able to then adjust their expectations made a big difference for most people. For some people, it's been tough. You know, I'm, some of my friends that I used to compete with, they've retired. So they plan on going to 2020 and the extra year has meant that they just can't carry on. And yeah. that's a really tough decision. Um, but I think the right decision was made for the postponement. It would have, would have been not a fair environment to hold a Games this year. And hopefully it can be a celebration for the whole world when it does come around next year. Yeah, absolutely. And for some of those athletes, do they do they need to sort of, um, you know, do they need to requalify or how does it uh, work? Any any qualif as I understand it now, I'm not the authority on this, but any anyone that's qualified already, the qualification stands. Yeah. Um, there's there's a whole bunch of athletes, mainly individual sports, that um, qualification hasn't taken place yet. So that's that's the big challenge in facing all sports is mm. actually managing the qualification process for next year for those athletes individuals and teams that have not um not qualified yet so that's what all sport is frantically working to figure out how that's going to be done and how it's going to be done in a fair way um, yep. but you know the most important thing is that we get athletes to tokyo they get to compete because for an athlete to lose a games that means eight years between games that could be an athlete's entire career um they've got to be able to be there to compete and we've got to be able to broadcast it to the world to inspire them 
And if we can just do those two things, it doesn't need spectators. It doesn't need anything else. That's just my personal view, not a view of anyone else. Yeah. Um, but all, all we need to have is athletes competing in for it to be broadcast to the world, in yeah. my view. And um, I think that's achievable. Yeah, absolutely. And, and will you be there, mate? Will you head over? Uh, well, I was going to be this year. Um, who knows what sort of world we're living in next year. Yeah. So like, like everyone else, I'm flexible and... Um, I, all I want to see is that athletes get to compete. And if that means that I'm not able to get over there and, you know, foreign travelers aren't able to go into Japan to facilitate that, then that's, that's, um, something I'd be more than happy to forego not being there so that the athletes can compete. Yeah, that's cool. Now, um, so, you know, you've got the kids, you're at home now, you're in lockdown. Um, what, what does it look like for the family in the future? Do they, are they going to be pole vaulters or, uh, you're going to, push them into football or cricket or what, what's, where are they going? What sport? Oh, they're not getting pushed anywhere. Okay. So where, wherever, <laughs> I, well, I'm lucky. Like I, I my mum was an Olympian and my dad was a really good runner. He probably should have been an Olympian. Um, and I'm one of four kids and I'm the only one that really did athletics. My brother played footy. Um, and my uh, older brother and younger sister really didn't have, an interest in playing sport, you know? So we all went very different ways and we were just supporting whatever we want to do. And that's all I want to do for my kids. Uh, if they want to, if they want to pole vault, then I'll support that. Um, so long as their attitude to it is right. Um, if, if they want to do anything else, I'll try and find the right people to have around them to, to give them, you know, a good club environment and good coaches so that it's a, it's a positive experience for them. And actually I said, how do you de- define that then, Steve? If you're looking for a club, for example, and you know we work, we work in good sports and surround healthy behaviours and, and you know really safe environments for, for people to connect and play sport, how would you identify the appropriate place to to send a kid? Uh, I wouldn't just sign them up somewhere and then leave them there. I'd, I'd you know I want to meet the people and talk to them and understand their philosophies about how they go about things, what the priorities are. You know, like is it a win at all cost mentality or is it a you know, like, is it, um, you know, about bringing people together? Like, I, I just, I'd like to understand their, you know, p- the coaches and the, and the organization's philosophies. And then yeah. so long as those things align, then, you know, everyone's going to get along and you can have some trust in these people because there's, there's a lot of trust involved in, in taking your kids somewhere and letting them spend a huge amount of, of their life there. It will shape, it'll shape a lot of who they're going to be as people. Yeah. yeah big responsibility. Um, absolutely. Yeah, sporting clubs play a critical role. Um, I guess then... Moving through, so with, with regards to um, some audience questions here, mate, I've got a couple um, from Satish from uh, Kunung Heights. He, he's got a question for you, guys. Um, how important do you think the survival of grassroots sport is in, in post-COVID world? I guess that sort of aligns well to what you've just mentioned there about you know sporting clubs being a place for opportunity to grow. Yeah, it's so important. It's so important. Um, uh, uh, my hope is that government put a lot of support around enabling grassroots sports to get it back up and running. Um, it's going to take, th- this has been such a dramatic change in how people live their lives and, and people feel um, so physically disconnected from other people. And, and it's an ideal environment to, to get people back into, to, to reconnect, particularly around areas that they've got passion about. So my hope is that we see huge amounts of government support in getting it back up and running and, and allowing clubs that are probably in difficult financial positions to, to be able to pro- provide these environments for young kids. Just totally critical. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. In regards to, you know, your kids playing sport, I know you're a Carlton fan. Can I just, can I put it like, surely you'd like one of them to play AFL and, and maybe for the Blues? Uh, if they want to. <laughs> like... Like it's, uh, elite sports, not that easy, you know, like it's, it's not that, it's not that easy. And, and, and it's, it takes a, t- a particular type of person to, to, um, to live that life. It's not for everyone. So, um, it's, it's a, it's a fantastic experience if you've got good people around you and you really love what you're doing, but if you're not in love with the sport and if, pa- if the passion doesn't come first and the excellence is what the driver is, it gets hard. Yeah. So you've got, you've, got to, you've got to love what you're doing. You've got to love the, kind of the, the craft that you're trying to hone. And that's the most important thing. So I would rather them find something they love doing and they're really mediocre at it than find something they're excellent at doing but they hate turning up every day. You know, like you, you see it every day. Like, I don't know, yeah. tennis players are a great example where 
they're just good at it and they get paid well to do it, but there's no happiness or joy in what they're doing. And I've, I'd rather see them being really happy, being pretty average at a sport than the alternative. Yeah, yeah, cool. Hey, I've got a political one here. I'm going to grab this from the chat. Steve, we be interested to see your views on the proposed merger between Little Ass and Athletics Australia. Oh, that's a positive step. So okay. um, I think that's a really important thing that has, um, it's taken a long time to get all of those organisations together. And I understand that everyone's concerned about making sure that um, they, the integrity of their own organisations is maintained. Um, but it's really important. You know, it's um, pathways are so important in sport and we've had a broken pathway in athletics forever. I went from a massive little athletics club, a boxy little athletics where there's hundreds and hundreds of kids to going into like an under 15s senior athletics um, environment at Box Hill Athletics Club where there was like six of us. So yeah. it's, it's really hard to keep people in the sport and to understand that there, whilst it's individual, there's a huge amount of people there and a great, like a great diversity of, of experience yeah. that you can have within an athletics club. So my hope is that um, that merger will result in um, smoothing out of that, um, that pathway and more, more people staying involved with athletics clubs for longer because it's just a, it's a great environment to keep looking after yourself um, throughout your life. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. All right. Change of pace a little bit. Let's, let's have a little bit of a chat around about the buzz of um, clearing six metres. So when you're one of the most spectacular heights in sport, I can imagine. So what's it like being up there? Oh, oh so you'll, you'll, you'll have, as a pole vault, you have many different days. You've got days where it's easy and days where it's hard. Generally, if you're going to jump six metres, I think I did it six times or seven. Um, it's a day where it's feeling, you're feeling pretty good. Yep. You know, like you, you, you're going to progress through the heights really quickly. You might open at like 560 or 570, jump a 70, an 80 or a 90, and then you go to six metres. So you're still really fresh. You're feeling really good and everything is in rhythm. Um, and I will tell you one thing. You, you don't stand at the end of the runway when there's a six metre bar in front of you and think, geez, I don't think I can jump that. You know, if, if you're thinking that, you're not going to jump it. So you're standing there with like, you yep. stand there very confident that you've got everything in the right place physically and mentally and with your equipment um, to make it work. And it's a great experience like to, to be sitting there and looking at this thing and thinking, yeah, I've got this. Yeah, it's something yeah. that's like a ridiculous thing to do, really use a piece of fiberglass to jump six metres. But to be standing there and thinking, yeah, I've got this, I've figured out how to do this. And then to be able to just, um, you know, you push a button and everything starts and you jump it. It's a, it's a great experience, but it's about the whole, it's not just about that moment of being over the bar. Yeah. It's, it's the whole thing. It's the day, you know, it's, it's the week leading into that competition, all of the jumps that lead up to it. And then knowing in that moment that you've got it, that's, that's the best yeah. bit. And then afterwards it's awesome. It's a celebration, but it's all yeah. that stuff leading into it. That's a really cool experience. Yeah. Yeah. For what it's worth, everyone, like, I have a kick of the footy with Steve occasionally on a Sunday morning and one of the footballs went over a fence and the entire group of us just conceded the ball was lost. Steve ran over and just popped over it and then popped back over again to collect the ball. So that's the type of, I guess, genetics he has. It's got some crossover, the skills for everyday life. <laughs> Very few, but every now and then it comes in handy. And, and I really, well, and I'll say another thing, I hate when I'm playing against you and you're defending because those levers, those arms are just everywhere and I cannot get the ball through. So you know, Sometimes um, you get lucky. That's what I mean. I found my sport. So your height in pole vault is not actually how tall you are measured to the top of your head. It's how tall you are when you reach your arm above your head because that, that's your angle that you create at the takeoff. So um, well, reach your eyes reckon, high as you can. I reckon the Blues could have done with, uh, you know, an, an athletic wingman that can, you know, take an intercept mark and give him some runoff half back, mate. So, wow. yeah, Thank you very much. Push. Appreciate but, um, it. Maybe, maybe, maybe there's still a chance. Who knows? Well, that was the plan. We were meant to play some footy together, but, hey, you know, whatever. It's happened. Um, let's, let's look at some... Um, fast paced stuff to sort of finish with. So like, like music, did you listen to music to get you pumped up to jump and things like that? Uh, depends on, depending on the day, like in competition days, like I never really listened to music. So yeah. I would be, and, and when I was like doing most of my training, I wouldn't, but uh, like when I'm in the midst of training, um, I would always be trying to focus on movement and what I'm doing, like really focus on the task. Yeah. Um, but no, like, it, like on the bus, on the way to the track, I would have like, I would set up a playlist. Um, in, in Beijing, I, I actually created a playlist and it, the word gold was either in the artist, the song or the album of every song on that playlist. So I was just yeah. trying, to, trying to get in that headspace. And I remember that very clearly. So I've got that playlist still floating around somewhere, but every, and, and, but the problem with that was I, I realized 
one of my pump up songs for the whole year was actually by a band called Silver Sun Pickups, which I, re- I kind of maybe blew it. So I, I stopped thinking about it. Pretty <laughs> <laughs> what about our favourite sports movie? What is it? Um, it's sort of not really a sports movie, but I love the sports bit from it. And I kind of love that it shows that sports people are not just sports people. It's just a part of their life. And it's actually a super old one. I don't know if anyone's seen Gallipoli. It's got Mel Gibson in it. Yeah. I remember watching it when I was a kid. And there's the, um, the, one of the people that goes off to war is a sprinter and he talks about his legs being steel springs. And I just yeah, love that. that is a gonna, cool and you're going to run as quote. fast as a leopard, you know? And I, I just yeah. kind of love that. I kind of love that as a, a yeah. sports theme to a movie. That, that is cool. What about um, before, you, before you're um, competing, what, what do you eat? Are you carb uh, loading? The, or same, or same, the same thing I eat every day, yeah. It's, it's um, <laughs> just try and keep everything consistent before a competition. You don't want to wake up feeling funny. So, yep. you know, for me, it's just salad, veg, um, some, some sort of meat or fish or something. That's pretty much it. Like that's, that was pretty much what I ate through my whole childhood and through training and before a competition. So just keeping it pretty simple, particularly dinner before a competition. Yeah, nice. Um, favourite place to compete? Um, probably the Berlin Olympic Stadium. Um, so every year they hold a competition there. It's called the ISTAF like 80,000 Germans in there and it's crazy but that but that's also where the 2009 world championships were held so um I had I had a couple of really good results in that stadium a couple of really poor results in that stadium but I always loved competing there yeah okay that's cool and uh if you could play another sport and and it's historic like that that's the Jesse Owens stadium like super historic place to compete but it's been modernized and it's an amazing modern stadium with crazy history and yeah some some really important results for me what was your first over trip, can I ask? Like, you know, when you're, you're junior, which was your first trip overseas yeah, to complete? Was, so I'd never left Australia prior to going away to World Juniors. And my first trip was to Santiago, Chile. And yeah, right. it was still a pretty, pretty wild time in Santiago. So we had like, you know, armed yeah. guards at our hotels and all these sorts of things. <laughs> so that was, it was an amazing trip. You know, you're competing in a stadium and the Andes mountain ranges are in the background. It was an incredible trip, a real eye opener and really made me hungry to travel more with my sport, which I was very lucky to be able to do to many of the many, many parts around the world. Yeah. And when doing that, did you get many like sightseeing? Did you stay on afterwards and things like that? Uh, I'm not a great holiday maker, you know, like I'm <laughs> I sort of, I'm pretty, pretty, like I, I really enjoy taking places in when I'm there, but I'm like often I'll be in a place for three or four days. You've got a couple of days before I meet, you walk around, check them out, get a feel for the place. Um, but then as soon as like competition's done, I was like, all right, well, what's next? I'm training, I'm preparing. I'm not even really good at the end of season. Like as soon as I've yeah. had sort of two weeks off, I want to get back into things. So that was, I think it was a weakness for me, not being able to take the time to take it all in. Oh, I'm sure. Um, let's let's go with a couple more. Um, what about like first album? What, what's your first album? Did you buy a CD? Like what was it? Come oh, on. first album. Go, go. It was something, some trash. I don't know, Brian Adams or something. something oh. like <laughs> Brian Adams. Yeah, maybe Brian Adams. What Daryl Braithwaite? No, 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 I think it was summer of '69. I think it was probably something early days for me. Yeah. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, got a couple here as well before we finish up. Um, from the Essendon Rowing Club, do you have a three-point plan to re-engage our, our sporting club? Well, I don't know if Steve would. Um, three-point plan. <laughs> um, I, I, honestly, I'll just say do whatever you can do whenever you can do it. So yeah. it's going to be hard, but the more the, the sooner you can open up, um, you're going to have volunteers. I reckon that are going to want to come down and help. It's going to be hard. It's going to take people power and it's going to take organization, but everyone's pretty keen to go out and get engaged and be involved in things. So reach out to the people and open up with whatever you can, whenever you can is what I would say. I think that's a really good point, mate, because, you know, you know, as well as I do sport plays such a critical role in the community offering that connection. And, and, uh, and, you know, as we wrap it up here, um, you know, to all of our clubs who have joined us today, that's what today was essentially about. was just a, to check in on everyone, especially our Victorian um, clubs, know that what you do is really special to the community. It offers a place for people to belong and they, they haven't had that this year in particular, you know, given the, the circumstances we face. So um, for, for what it's worth, um, you know, you do a wonderful job and it's really important that 
that we get sport back going um, because it's really important for young people in particular and, and even the, the older ones like us. Um, but Steve, mate, I'll say thanks so much for your time. I know you've got plenty on your hands and, and things to do. For you, for you to give up your time and to talk to our, our clubs um, on behalf of the ADF, you know, I'm forever grateful, mate, and um, the Good Sports Program as well. Thanks you. Um, and to hear your story, it's been um, fantastic to, to listen to and to get some insight into um, how to achieve the ultimate um, prize. Oh, well, thank you to everyone here. Anyone here, you know, looking after clubs, looking after kids that are progressing through sport. Thank you to, for everything you do. Without the work that all of you guys do, then, you know, people don't realise that they can achieve some of the things they can achieve. So thank you all for all you're doing. I'm sure you're going to have a tough 12 months ahead. Um, but it'll be well worth it once everyone's back and buzzing around the place and um, doing the things they love again. Beautiful. Thanks, Steve, and thanks, everyone, for joining us. Really appreciate it. Um, look forward to connecting with everyone through the good sports, and um, take care. Thanks, bud. See you, mate. See you, everyone. Thanks, Clint. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank, thank you.